So Leon Brown, Clark Fork Outfitters, let's get into your history as not just an outfitter or guide or houndsman, but how'd you get started in hunting? Well, um, I guess to start with, I, I've been living in North Idaho all of my life. And from the time, well, before I was even born, my dad had, had hounds and he, he owned plots. Um, and, uh, <laughs> My mom used to say when she couldn't find me when I was like three or four years old, she always knew just go look in the dog houses. I'd be sleeping in one of the dog houses. So, you know, I guess you could say I was pretty much raised in a in a in a dog house with a hound dog. You know, um, but um, you know, I always hunted from the time I was young. I think my dad took me to my first bear tree when I was four, and um, he started taking me cat hunting when I was about ten because of the being out in the winter and stuff he waited till I was a little older and whatnot um you know when I was 15 I uh we were living up around Naples out behind MacArthur Lake and um there was a road that went up on White Mountain behind the house and one weekend I went up there on a snowmobile and I cut a nice tom lion track and I came back down to the house and I told my dad about it and um, he said, eh, you know, I'm not really feeling up to it. Why don't you just take those dogs? And I, I still remember what dogs it was. It was it was Uno and Tarzan and Jane. And he said, take them up there and turn them on it, and you just see if you can see if you get you can get this thing done by yourself. And I ended up I put those dogs on that thing, and I walked after that cat all day long on foot. This was before we had any GPS. Or I was anything like, there's like no that. GPS, right? No, no, there was no GPS back then. And I knew it was headed towards another road, but I had no idea if it would make it there. Or I, And I just knew my best chance of making sure I didn't lose my dad's dogs was if I walked behind them. So I walked all day long. And finally, right before dark, I caught up to the dogs and they had treed this nice big tom. Um, and uh, I shot that cat out and skinned it in the dark by myself. And then I ended up walking all the way back to the house because it had crossed that other road. And it was closer to go back to the other road and then walk down to the house. And then, of course, the next day after school, I had to hike all the way back up to where the snowmobile was and get it. Because um, we only had one running snowmobile back then. And um, that was the first time I ever caught an animal with hounds by myself. How old were you? 15 dude you are a gangster at age 15 first off like walking just trying to keep up with dogs and and then having the wherewithal to stay on them and not shortcut it out on that road and try to you know game it you got to just do your due diligence stay behind the dogs and then you walk up pretty good cat take care of it and then you skin it in the dark i bet you didn't have a headlamp no there was much for headlamps back then we used to carry Usually like three and four cell mag lights. They weighed about 12 pounds each. And, um, you know, then you might have another little backup, little ever ready flashlight two cell in your pocket or something. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that was kind of the beginning of it. And then I just, I got out of high school and got, by the time I was 16 or 17, I had a couple dogs of my own and got out of high school and started, um, hunting. Well, even when I was still in high school, I hunted every chance I got every minute. And as I got into my 20s, I eventually got a job guiding um, part time in the winter. And because um, I'd get laid off from construction or logging or whatever I was doing in the wintertime. And I wanted to hunt, but I couldn't afford to hunt every day on nothing but unemployment. So I finally got a job doing a little bit of guiding. Um, um, the first outfitter that hired me was Stan Sweet, um, was Moye River Outfitters. And uh, one thing just evolved into another, and pretty soon by about 07, 06, 05, maybe even 04, um, I was pretty much guiding as much as I could. I was working for th three, four different outfitters in Idaho, and I was doing some stuff in California and Nevada too, and still doing a little bit of construction on the side here and there. And then the economy 
crash. We had the housing crash in 2008, and I pretty much quit doing construction altogether and started just guiding um, from like 2008 through 11. 2012, Molly and I bought Clark Fork Outfitters, and um, I quit running around the country and um, guiding for other outfitters, and that's kind of where we've been ever since. Um, in 2014, we were able to buy out um, North Idaho Mountain Outfitting from uh, the Clemensons, and that was a contiguous area to the existing Clark Fork Outfitters area and combined the two areas. And um, yeah, so that gave me a good portion of the north end of Unit 4 in Idaho. Um, originally, Clark Fork Outfitters just had um, all of Unit 4A. That hugs the lake? Yeah, okay, that hugs sense. the lake and then wraps around and up the Clark Fork River all the way up to the Montana border there. So that's like the one thing about being an outfitter is like you can't just go, hey, I'm going to be an outfitter today. Like there's only an allotment of concessions or whatever they're called. Yeah. And so you had to kind of designated kinda areas, right? Find out when this one became available and outbid everybody or at least talk to them. Yeah. Well, I kind of had, I kind of had a bit of an inside track on both areas because I had guided for both outfitters. Okay. So we had working relationships yep. for years prior to that. Um, actually, the first, uh, the first televised or videoed hunt, I mean, professionally videoed hunt that I ever did was for Clark Fork Outfitters. And uh, it was for a lady named Brenda Valentine who had... Um, I know that name from back in the day. Yeah. yeah, yeah. she had. That was back when she had Whitetail Adventures with Brenda Valentine on the Outdoor Network and um, or Outdoor Channel, I guess it was. And um, so that was in 2004. That was, um, and that was quite an experience for me. Um, but she did a mountain lion hunt and uh, she got a nice cat. And, um, we got some good footage and, um, but anyway, um, I had working relationships with both of the businesses already. And, um, you know, I was able to eventually negotiate deals with both outfitters. And, um, so yeah, for the last 10 years, we've had both, both areas and just been kind of trudging, trudging along. Yeah. So 08 kind of forced your hand to, to really bet on yourself or double down on Leon versus it's like you and Molly talked and we're like, you know, it's run dry, the construction run. And I remember, man, I used to, I remember 08, I'm not, I'm old and we're probably close in age. And I just was like, you had to be able to pivot back in that day. Yeah. And so you pivoted by just doubling down on yourself and going all in on your own outfit. Um, were you guys apprehensive at all or, uh, just figured you you don't know what you don't know and you'll find out I mean oh it was it was probably one of the most uh, nerve-wracking things that we ever did um, to just go all in and say yeah we're gonna we're gonna buy the whole thing you know I mean when you're just guiding you don't make a lot of money but you don't have you know you don't have a lot of expenses either you know when you sign up you know, six digit mortgage on something, it becomes a whole nother ball game. You know, you've got to, yeah, you got to double down and, um, yeah, we worked, we worked our tails off and, uh, it took us a long time. We finally, um, finally have every, the business has paid off anyway. So that's a congratulations. Uh, what year did you graduate high school? 1994. Okay. So you're 94. I'm 2000. Um, talk to me about, 94 to 2001 those are the years that i didn't know anything about archery elk hunting which is now my life mm -hmm. uh, not really it's faith family fitness then elk hunting but uh, those years were magical in north idaho and i didn't experience it would like to lean in on what was it like going elk hunting in the panhandle in the late 90s well i wish i knew more about i wish i knew more about elk hunting back then um my dad didn't kill his first bull until i was almost about ready to get my hunting license he had been a houndsman for sure ever. um and when you start talking about the far north panhandle like up in unit one the 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 population wasn't as good up there in the selkirks and the cabinets 
um, and particularly the Selkirks probably, uh, in the eighties and nineties and seventies, as it was in say the St. Joe and the Coeur d'Alene river and further South in the Clearwater and so on. But we did see a, an elk explosion in the eighties and nineties. And so I guess it would have been about, Oh, 1985. My dad decided to take up elk hunting and, um, one of the first times he went out or the first time I ever went out with him, I actually stayed with my grandfather or step grandfather and my dad hiked way up on this mountain and we heard him shoot up there and, um, and he killed a 352 bull. That's his first bull. It was his first bull. And it's a North shot. Idaho 350 bull. So, you know, it's got tree trunk heavy, you know, that, you know, the deal. Yeah. It was, it was a massive, massive bull they're built um, different up there you know of course this was this was back in the day before range finders or anything like that and dad didn't judge the shot exactly right i mean shoot he was shooting a 30-06 and it was a long shot and unfortunately did not find the bull till i guess it was a couple days later or something anyway um when he did find it there was a bear eating it which bluff charged him and he ended up shooting the bear so my real memory as a 10 year old boy down there on the road with grandpa is watching my dad coming down the hill with a 350 bull rack over his shoulders dragging about a 250 pound bear behind him Dude, your dad's a legend is your dad still alive yep that's cool how old's your dad dad just turned 74 um friday Years young is he was uh was he a logger was he in no, construction no he did mostly construction did some guiding um but mostly construction okay yep. yeah i just know from good friends like uh like dan evans he he was living in saint mary's and hunting it right. in the late 90s and uh he showed me all the photos and my father-in-law terry turnbow he's a kellogg boy so gotcha. he grew up hunting right there in the 70s when he was playing high school, 80s, 90s. And even the, and I didn't start rubbing elbows with my father-in-law until I met my wife in 09. And by 09, I'd been kind of figured out elk hunting a little bit. And sure. uh, we started talking to him, and he was just telling me, you're not hunting the heyday, bro. It's not like it was. And it was pretty freaking good when we were talking at that point in time. Right. So I can only imagine. But just to give you an example, right. it was like he would say, you pretty much head into any drainage, get a herd bull to answer you, and he'd have anywhere between three and six satellite bulls spread out throughout the drainage. And it meant, and it's North Idaho, so like it's vocalization. And, and I remember those days, you know, when I first started. So I didn't kill my first bull until about 92 myself. And, um, I bugled that bull in, it was a five point bull. And I bugled it in about a half a mile from our house. We, li we lived in a good spot when I was a kid. I mean, I killed my first elk, my first deer, my first bear. Well, no, not my first bear, but my first elk, my first deer and my first lion. I pretty much walked from the house to kill all of them. Or I was within walking distance That's of the awesome. house when I killed all of them. But, um, so I didn't even start elk hunting or, or kill an elk anyway, till I was like 16 years old. But I, but the minute I bugled in that for, I bugled him in after school one day and, um, I was hooked completely on, on elk hunting. And, um, I started guiding elk hunts in like Oh four for Clark Fork Outfitters. And I remember, you know, going in one drainage in particular, I remember standing there and I had a big herd bull in the bottom answering me. And then I had, I believe it was seven other bulls in that, in that drainage that were talking all around him. And then we spotted, I think it was two raghorns and a spike that were feeding on a brushy hillside on the other side. They were in that, but they weren't saying a word. They weren't even interested. Yeah. No, they didn't. They'd already had their butts ran off a long time ago. Yep. And they weren't even, they weren't even, they wouldn't even pick their head up when another bull would bugle. And I mean, it was like, it was nonstop bugling in that hole. There was a bull bugling somewhere. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was just, it was, it was crazy. And I mean, 
I managed to find success as a guide archery hunting the very first year I ever guided archery hunters. And I had never even, I had never even shot an elk with a bow at that point in time. I didn't, matter of fact, I'm not even sure if I owned a bow. Yep. It was actually the fact that I was like, well, if I'm going to be out, cause I'd always just been a rifle hunter and I'd always been able to fill my tag, but I decided, well, I guess if I'm going to be out here guiding guys on elk archery hunts, I better learn how to do this myself, you know? And, um, like I said, I was fortunate enough to find success that first, first season, the first hunt I ever guided. Actually, we had, we, we had, I don't know how many bulls in archery range. Um, and it was the second bull that we shot at that we actually ended up killing. Um, so that was really where my archery elk hunting thing started was about 05. And then by 010 or yeah, by 10, I started finding wolf tracks in 2010. Was that first year for you? It was the first year. Yeah. You know, they kind of, they came up through the clear water and then they got into the St. Joe. Then they got into the South into unit four. And then there was wolves that were kind of moving down out of Canada, coming down through unit one. And the two populations seemed to have kind of met right where you right are. Where at. That was. makes and so, so much they sense. Didn't, they didn't really show up there the winter of 2010 when I was lion hunting, I found a single wolf track walking through. The winter of 2011, I found a pair of wolf tracks walking through. The winter of 2012, there was a whole pack. And by the winter of 13, 14, there was multiple packs. That's how fast they, you know, took it when they did. But, you know, those years. I'm getting years... chills just because, like, I have a very strict timeline. I had a place in the St. Joe for years, for mm -hmm. 15 years. My dad and I bought a cab and before before I had kids and a wife when I actually had money. And uh, that was a joke. But I, uh, we bought it together, and we bought it just for hunting. Right. And so I grew up hunting, you know, units six, seven, nine. And I, there was a point in time where I wouldn't mention units on this podcast, but I don't elk hunt there anymore. Uh, and so in 07 was like the first year that I heard wolves. It was in 07, and I was in basically Unit 9, real close to the Clearwater. Right. And I was on top of a mountain. It was dark, and I my, was waiting for my dad to meet me at our meetup spot. And I kid you not, Leon, I literally, when my dad walked up to me, I was like, Dad, do you hear that ambulance? Why would an ambulance have its sirens on out here? Somebody must have got hurt. And he's like, I thought the exact same thing, and then I did the math. There, that, ain't, that ain't an ambulance, Dan. Those are, those are wolves. And I was like, yeah, and we told a few people and they didn't believe us or whatever. And then it was 2011 when I finally seen my first wolf pack in the Joe. Actually, it was not the Joe. It was the, uh, what's the, uh, what part of the Coeur d'Alene ties into the St. Joe? Well. With the south end of Unit 4? Yeah, well, I mean, the South Fork runs up towards, up towards, like, Lookout Pass. Yeah, um, so it was right in that so area. So, like, you know, you go up over Moon Pass, yeah. say, you'd be dropping down into the South Fork. It was but, right there. It was mm -hmm. 2011, and I had, um, I was hunting that particular unit. I think it was August 30th, mm -hmm. and on that side of the divide, you could hunt August 30th, but if you were on the south side of the divide, you had to wait till September 6th. They had changed the archery dates. So I'm like, well, I got this tag. Let's go hunt the north side of the divide. Two two five point bulls in a beautiful North Idaho basin, which those are few and far between. Oh yeah. No trees. We're on the rim. We're watching two bulls feeding and we're just waiting for the thermals to switch Leon. And so this is great. I got my old buddy, Dave Renberg with me and he's in his late sixties. He's just kind of a mentor and he's there to call for me. And then we hear our, a wolf howl. And I was like, did you hear that Dave? And Dave can't hear for, for shit. And he's like, no, I didn't hear it. And I was like, no, nah, dude, I swear to you. I just heard a wolf. Did you hear that one? Did you hear that one? And then it was all of a sudden, every finger had a wolf howling. And those two bulls just jammed straight to the bottom where the timber started in the bowl. And I looked at Dave and I said, I'm going down there. And he's like, all right. And we went straight down into the timber to try to catch up with those bulls. And on our way down, we seen the alpha male and female. And at the time, I didn't know what an alpha male female looked like, but I did get it on video. Sure enough, it's the lead male dog and the lead female dog hunting these same elk. We get down in the bottom of that timber, 
And next thing you know, we're surrounded by an entire pack and it's a double digit pack. Uh, pups, juveniles, adults, and then the two alphas. And then the alpha male is just not afraid of us. He's like literally just going back and forth, just trying to get a good look at us. And meanwhile, I'm looking for this elk and I can't even remember. I, do, I think it was legal to hunt wolves at that point. What year was it? 2011. How did that go? You know, I think that was. And then I the, think the very that, next year, 12, they shut it down for a year. Yeah, I was. I was thinking that it was 10, we had the hunting season, 11, they shut it down, and then 12, we got a hunting and trapping season. But it, I could, yeah. my, my timeline could be off by I a year. I feel like there I got too. my trapping license in 2010, but I could be off on my dates. I'm not sure. But either way, I just remember we, we did not have wolf tags. So we didn't shoot at wolves, but man, it was a crazy encounter and we got it on video and that video is on YouTube somewhere and it's still my most viewed video, uh, but that was my first real encounter. And then ever since then, and, and I don't want to go down a long wolf hole, but like I've seen um, at least 100 wolves with my own two eyeballs from 2011 to my last year I hunted North Idaho elk was 2019. And a lot of that was just me competing with them to hunt elk straight up so a herd bulls bugling in the bottom i'm sneaking in i bump into a pack that's sneaking in as well or if i make cow calls i got a wolf coming in um and so there's just so many encounters that i i was telling jacob your guide about a few of them but i've just seen them and then it, it just your timeline is very similar to mine to where well, there's a reason that was the last year, 2019, that I ever just bought a North Idaho oak tag. I was just, I'm just tired of running into wolves. I'm tired of picking up dead oak calves specifically. Um, and um, I, I'm not shitting on wolves. Like, they're a cool animal, but it just seemed like, wow, it overnight they were there. I mean, just incredible. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I mean, I think this is something that, I mean, I, I don't know that it, I don't know that it, there's anything we can do about it now. Obviously, they're here, and they're here to stay. Um, I mean, I know a lot of people who have dedicated a ton of time into hunting and trapping them. We're never going to get rid of them by any means. Um, we're, we're doing... A, at our, you know, it, it's taking a ton of effort just to kind of hold the, keep a lid on the numbers. But I, I do think that one of the, you know, one of the big problems we've got with the whole situation is that, you know, these aren't the wolves that, that were here. These aren't, these are not native wolves. Yeah. You know, yeah. this is a, this is a, a larger, more aggressive, probably strain that was brought from, you know, up in Alberta, Northern Alberta, um, I think that, you know, um, like you say, before the wolves were ever brought into Idaho, um, I was starting to find an occasional wolf track coming out of Canada up in Bonners. And, you know, I watched that go from a wolf track to a pair of wolf tracks, to a group of wolves, and it, and by the time by the time there was a, getting to be like a group of wolves, then people were starting to talk about the wolves that had been dropped down in the Nez Perce and the the wilderness and Yellowstone, and um, and whatever. But those wolves were still a long, long ways away. The the wolf tracks we were finding up around Bonner's Ferry, just north of the Canadian border, those were native wolves that had just moved in on their own. And, um, so I feel like bringing those wolves here was really an unnecessary thing. They were on their way already. They just hadn't quite got here yet. I think you're going to see that same thing in Colorado where, you know, the, the reintroduction wolves of 96 Yellowstone are going to make their way into and have Utah, Colorado wolves. If, if people are going to call BS on anything we're saying, I would just invite you to look at a colored map of a wolf in Wyoming and it'll literally tour the entire state yeah. and not even blink uh, to the point where when I've tried hunting wolves myself, I kind of started figuring them out because they would like end up in the same drainage as me. A lot of the times about every third or fourth week, 
Right. They just show back up and you start doing the math. They're, they're kind of doing 70, 80 mile loops. They got a circuit. Mm-hmm. And they're um, they're they're efficient killers. Uh, so I know in my home state, Washington, we've had wolves coming down from Canada. Always, there's just been a constant. Like there's not a border for them. No, it's a no. blurred line. And um, yeah, it's interesting. At least your state gets has a has a management program. Imagine being in my state where there there's nothing we can do. It's. Um you know, the, the, the lack of action by Washington and Oregon both, because, you know, they've been delisted in eastern Washington, eastern Oregon for quite some time. And, um, I mean, the lack of action by the, the states, it just, um, it's hard to, hard to wrap your head around it as a, as a sportsman and as a hunter. Um, you know, it's uh, pretty sad to see the west side just dictate policy and, mm-hmm. You know, um, they're not the ones that are, you know, the people in the people in Tacoma are not the ones living out here in Chihuahua with sure. wolf packs running through their back pasture and whatever, you know. Well, you look um, at Colorado. I mean, it's Denver and Boulder that voted ballot boxed those oh, yeah. wolves in. Um, you ever been to Banff or Glacier? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know what's cool when you go to a national park? Like there's no hunting allowed, right? So you see mule deer and mountain goats and sheep. You know what you also see? Grizzly bears that don't give an F about you and aren't scared of you. You know, what's also interesting is those same grizzly bears in the national park also roam outside the park in the same grounds that we recreate in. And it's the same rule. You can't hunt them. So you get that same behavior of, well, why would I be afraid of man? You know, or even if your dogs ran across a grizzly it's not going to be pretty, man. So I, to, to pivot the conversation, like I'm all for managing animals and making sure they're on the landscape, like 1000%, but also in favor of having kind of dominion of the land a little into the, the lens of I'd rather a grizzly bear have like a memory of not a good encounter with a human. Oh, absolutely. Versus no recollection of that ever and not, you know, because how many grizzlies have you ran into in, in just in your area? I, I have never had a firsthand encounter with a grizzly and we've only ever even had a couple of uh, like trail camera pictures. Um, you have had them on trail cam? Yeah, mostly just one bear. Okay. It, it, you know, that, that bear, um, and it's just been in the last couple of years and it doesn't stick around. Um, it comes in there or I don't think it ever came in there last fall, but the two falls before it came in there, it hit a couple of baits. We quit baiting. Of course, immediately quit baiting the bait. Yeah. Um, we don't want to, you know, condition it and whatever. And then it, it wandered off, went back across the Clark Fork river and went back up into the cabinets, you know? Really? Um, yep. Yeah. Um, and so I've never had a firsthand encounter. Um, I've only seen one grizzly bear in Idaho myself. Um, but, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is they're spreading out more and more all the time. And, um, you know, I, I think it's, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's actually a sign of a good thing. I mean, I, I don't really want, I don't want to deal with an encounter with one, to be sure. honest, but the fact that, that, you know, they're showing up in more and more new places, it shows, you know, how successful the recovery is is and has been and um hopefully that success will eventually lead to you know um the state of idaho being able to take control back over of management um but at any rate um, speaking of like state of idaho so we idaho has to agree with the fed so federal fishing game on a certain like number of breeding pairs for wolves throughout the entire state. And Idaho, if you flatten out Idaho, it's a pretty big state. You I've know always, what I mean? I've always said if you flattened it out, it'd probably be close, it'd be, be as big as Texas. You I know mean, what I mean? That might be an exaggeration, but. I don't think you're wrong. Sometimes, <laughs> like, when you head into the Frank Church, the largest wilderness in the lower 48, and you flatten that sucker out. So, anyways, Idaho's got trees, unless you're talking southeast Idaho. I'm not talking Island Park. I'm talking just right down the middle Idaho, right. timber country can't really survey via aerial and get a precise count of pairs but 
Idaho has agreed like, hey, we're at your number and then some. Right. So stay off our back. Right. Which is still up for litigation and things like that constantly in and out, you know, but we're at the we're at a point where like Idaho has definitely plenty of wolves. Oh yeah. Right? There you I, I don't know of a single place you can go in the state of Idaho where you aren't likely to find some sort of wolf sign. Sure. I mean, it might be a couple of it might be a pair, it might be ten or twenty of them. Yep. But there's wolves present on the landscape throughout the state. I, I, I've never messed around like in the Owyhees or any of that stuff. So, I, I mean, I imagine you get south of Boise, south of Pocatello down in there. There may be some areas that are still wolf-free per se. Um, but, um, you know, just being the nature of what they are, um, they're going to um, undoubtedly, with as, with as quickly as they – expanded from the areas they were originally you know dropped and then the wolves the, the few that were coming down out of canada as quickly as they were able to inhabit the entire state of idaho all of western montana all of northwest wyoming all of eastern washington all of eastern oregon and northern california you're talking about a scope of a little over 20 years mm. Um, that's a massive amount of country. So the little pockets that might still not have wolves in them right now, you know, um, I don't think, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, I don't think that it's going to stay that way. Mm. I, well, at least we can, at least we have trapping in place in Idaho. When I say absolutely. we, I mean, I'm a Washington resident, so I'm just cheering for you guys, but, uh, been a member of Foundation for Wildlife. Uh, love awesome. what they got going on yep. there. Just Justin Webb. Justin Webb. Yep. Good dude. He used to work for you. Yep. Um, yeah. He's I, running the program. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I lost one of the best guides I've ever had, but I lost him to a darn good cause. And he's full time on that, which is yep. really excites me. And Justin, if you're listening, I know you are. Don't be discouraged. Be encouraged. We need you to stay where you're at. Like I, I'm sure he takes his lumps. It's he's 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 in an uphill battle, but man, you're doing the Lord's work. And if you guys don't know what the Foundation for Wildlife is, essentially it is a program to where you can kind of help not eliminate, but you can help cover some of the costs associated with running a trap line for wolves in the middle of BFE, Idaho. Yeah, it's a I mean it's a it's a it's a it's a sportsman's organization with you know um where it's a basically a, it's a way of doing some shared cost if you're a member you know any money that you put into the foundation will end up getting used to reimburse a guy who went out there and actually took a wolf off of the landscape it's a great I mean, it's a great program um you know i'm i'm personal friends with several of the founding members as well as justin actually justin and i went to school in the third grade together oh really oh yeah cool yeah we used to go grouse hunting when i was i mean yeah my earliest memory of justin webb was me and him going grouse hunting out behind his old house when we were in the third grade yeah so i've known him for a minute okay but um if anybody's interested in that and if you haven't already signed up and um got you know on their mailing lists and things like that um f4wm.org is where you can go to get any information you want about the foundation. And essentially, I'm just encouraging anyone, all 10,000 of you who bought an over-the-counter tag in Idaho, which is going to be a good segue for you in a second, please accompany that with a cheap $40 wolf tag. And then also, while you're out, get your membership, help the foundation reimburse some of these guys that are checking their traps every 72 hours going way back tons of fuel in their truck their snowmobile just their time their effort only to find that their pans frozen and they got to unthaw it and get it reset all the dying of tra i mean guys trapping is an art and it's expensive in time and actually money um a lot of money you get a membership and you can help pay for some of that and if you get a wolf you can get reimbursed for your expenses as well it's a great organization but speaking of the 10,000 plus tags that get sold out on December 1st every year and i know that a lot of people are upset about how Idaho does it but it is what it is 
outfitters like yourself get allocated some tags. We get al allocated a small handful of tags. And um, so that's, I mean, that's, that's a, a great thing for us. And I'm just hearing now that unfortunately there's, there's going to be another change and it seems like as soon as <laughs> seems like as soon as we figure out what what we got going on now then they change everything again but what i'm hearing is that um there's a there's a bill in the house ways and means committee right now to take a lot of this stuff to a draw um and um we're being told that they are going to protect the outfitter allocation. Um, I think that's cool. But, um, you know, I think there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of unhappy people about the way that, you know, it's just been such a, it's been such a mad rush to try to get a tag in Idaho for the last couple of years that um, everybody's complaining about it. And so, you know, now the, the new, um, the new bill that is in the House Ways and Means Committee would turn it, and I don't know the particulars. I don't know that this is, I think it's going to deal mostly with non-resident tags, but I, I just briefly had a discussion with, an, with a fellow, um, actually Outfitter's wife, um, yesterday, and it wasn't even a, a discussion. It was a messaging session. Um, but, uh, yeah, apparently there is a bill that's in the House right now uh, in the Ways and, Ways and Means Committee, and it is to make, I believe, all non-resident tags for deer and elk. Um, I'm not I'm not even sure if it applies to deer and elk, or if it's just elk, or what. I'm, I don't I don't know much about the particulars. Um, I believe it was Bill. Was it? Six something, I, you know. Like I say, I just became aware of this yesterday. Oh yeah, so. people could look it up, but it is uh, yeah. it is happening. I am a non-resident. I've hunted Idaho since two thousand one. Never missed a year. Okay, I understand. Turn, turn it to a draw. I get the. I get it. Uh, I wouldn't be particularly stoked about it, but I also I have ways around this. I could hire you. You could for a week. If I don't get my elk, see you, Leon. I'm still going elk hunting. Okay, so I, well, you, you know, get a tag. It's valid. Trust me, I know this. You hunt with an outfitter, and you doesn't you don't get your animal, but it's still season. You could you could keep hunting after your outfit time. Maybe you get one while they're with you. But I just wanted to highlight, like you are an option for those that didn't get a tag. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Archery or rifle. Mm -hmm. um, and then if it does go to a draw, it is what it is. Like, I'm not going to complain. I'm not a person who stands around and complains. I'm going to, I'm going to make my own changes. If I need to change, like one thing that sucks and I will agree with a lot of people is like, there's a pile of non-residents that show up, fly into Boise or whatever here and Spokane, they go and whatever, buy yeah. tags for their entire squad and family members. I don't like that. You know what I mean? Like in person instead of, and while everyone else is waiting online to get their tag, and they're all getting sold out because the guys in in person are getting the tags. Make a make a rule change, Idaho, where you cannot buy a tag for anyone but yourself. That would probably shut that down pretty fast, as far as scooping up all the tags. Um, but I always think, and I've always thought, as an outfitter, is a good backup plan. If you didn't get a tag, Ups, yeah, to hunt, and even North Idaho, because man, you got still got elk bugling. And oh, it's yeah. going to be a bugling game in oh, North yeah. Idaho. So oh, it's going to yeah. be exciting. Oh, yeah. In fact, I'll say it. If you can get an elk in North Idaho, you darn near can get an elk anywhere else. Like this is teaching grounds for how to deal with the brush, how to vocalize, how to deal with other predators that are pretty worthy adversaries to these animals, how to yeah. navigate through some pretty steep, nasty country. North Idaho is training grounds to make you a better hunter. Yeah. I mean, I believe, I believe if you can fill your tag every year in North Idaho, um, you can probably go anywhere and do it, you know, and I mean, we, <laughs> we've said the same thing about the hounds. If you, you know, we've always figured, well, if they can, if they can catch game in North Idaho, because those dogs have the same 
all those same obstacles, blowdowns, you know, yeah. on and on, you know, up and down, up and down. And yeah, it, it, I think it is. It is one of the more difficult places to hunt, but we do have the opportunity to guarantee people. I mean, no, no we can't guarantee a hundred people a tag, but for a select dozen or so people or whatever for, you know, we can guarantee you a tag and that's worth something in its own right Agreed. to be able to, I mean, just to be able to, you know, call me up and say, Hey, I want to go elk hunting, this, that, and the other thing. And the first thing I'm going to say is, okay, well, how old are you? What kind of physical shape, shape are you in? Tell me about any bad injuries you've had, this, that, and the other thing. Yes. And, um, and a lot of people are going to be disappointed after they get done talking to me. Cause Do you know what huckleberry brush looks like, feels like, tastes like, uh, <laughs> alders. Uh, but honestly, I, Leon, and if you did, you, we didn't get to hang out very much on that cat hunt we just did, but man, like North Idaho is in me, man. Like that to me is home. Like I love that North brush country. Um, you want to feel insignificant. You want to feel challenged. You want to see some wild landscapes in the most beautiful densely forested areas. Like just the video that Jeff edited with the cat in the bottom of the roaring Creek with the bright green moss and the giant white snowflakes. Like I can describe it because it's burned in my mind as one of the most beautiful places sure. on planet earth. Sure. And so I do think everyone should come experience it yeah. and you can get a deer tag. You can get an elk tag. You can get a bear tag, which by the way, I want to talk about bears with you because oh, I know, absolutely. I know you know a thing or two. Um, I didn't start bear hunting until 07. And I went with Sportsman's Warehouse. I was working for them. And they sent me to go hunt with this kid named, well, Joe Cabral and his son, Chris Cabral, which I'm Chris, sure you know. Yep. And I know Chris. Um, I went with them in the clear, yeah, the, the clear, clear it water. Have, it would have been in the St. Joe or the clear water. It was the clear water yeah. in 07 at their bear camp. And we were filming it for Sportsman's Warehouse. And that was my first time on a bear hunt. I brought my dad, I think. And, um, just kind of watch these guys baiting and, and doing their thing. And Chris run dogs as well. And I'll just save you the cliff notes version is like, I remember distinctly my dad and I in camp looking at each other going like, dude, we could do this on our own. Like this, this could be cool to like, like run a bait. Like they are like, let's ask a lot of questions and let's, we live right next door to Idaho. We could do this. And Oh wait, I think we baited bears for the next eight to 10 years, like do DIY. And we learned everything from the Cabral's. So thank you Cabral's for unknowingly teaching us your best tricks. But honestly, it was cool to see you. I met guys from all over the country that were coming to hunt bears. And it's a cool vibe. Like for, for anyone interested in spring bear hunting with someone like Leon is like, you know, you'll have to talk about using hounds. Cause I don't know a lot about it, but for just for even baits, it's a pretty low key hunt. Like you're not getting up at the crack of dawn, but I promise you, you are staying up super late yep. and, uh, baiting is actually, if I had a choice, I wouldn't bait right now. And it's not because I don't think baiting is, I think baiting is harder. Quite honestly, for me, it's just so much time and energy and effort. It's a lot of work that I'm better off not baiting and just going and, and spotting and stalking. Well, you know, the, the thing about baiting is it can be very, it can be effective, but it's only effective if you are, you know, my, what I always say is your bears are, your bears will be about as consistent as you are. That is to say, if there's food there every day, they'll show up every day, yep. but you let that bait run dry for over 24 hours and those bears will wander. A bear's going to find something to eat. He's going to wander off and go somewhere else, find something to eat somewhere else. So in order to do it right, you either have to, you know, you either have to do it like we do it and be out there multiple days a week, restocking that bait, this, that, or the other thing. And that means you have to be somewhere in that, you know, somewhere within driving distance. You have to have the time, the energy, the gas money, all that, and the bait, and all that in order to do it, you know, effectively. Um, but if you, you know, I mean, if you want to just come out and enjoy a nice hunt and whatever, you know, we've got the baits that have been stocked for, you know, some time before you ever going to arrive to come hunting. And, um, you know, 
we we put a lot of time and a lot of energy into our baits. And you have the baits that have been out for decades where like there are bears that have onyx in their brain and they have it like waypoints dropped at all your historical baits and that's all they've ever known like they know there's a food source there come spring oh yeah that's a huge advantage and you can't just throw bait out randomly willy-nilly and be like oh this the bears are going to come and i can i can no, hunt over this no it, explain it, that nuance a little bit well you know typically you know, like the very first bait I established that was good, and this was before I ever guided a, this is before I ever even guided a hunter. Um, and I, I still, that bait, I started it in the area that is now my outfitting area. And I still have that bait going. That bait was started in about 1996. So that bait's been there for like 30 years. <laughs> and um, yeah, so there's generations of bears that have come to that same spot. And, um, the reason, the way I keyed in on it originally was that over the years, we had struck a lot of bears with our hounds driving right through this one little saddle. And so when the bears started getting educated enough, and, and a lot of what it was was, you know, the Forest Service shut down a lot of roads. So it made it where there was just a skeleton of the road system that used to be there. Well, it wasn't that hard for a bear to stay away from those few roads and not have to worry about getting chased around by dogs. Bears are smart, they adapt, they learn that kind of stuff. And it got to a point where if you wanted to run a bear every day with your dogs, um, and I've never shot a bear at a bait in my whole life. I've probably guided and outfitted, I'd be scared to guess how many guys that have taken bears at baits. I've never shot a bear at a bait in my life. I, it's just, um, I mean, uh, I guess by the time I started really seriously baiting, like with tree stands and all that stuff, I was already guiding and I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for my clients. Um, and I had already taken a lot of bears in my life by that point in time. I really no reason to shoot another one. Um, other than the meat, the meat is if you have, if you don't eat bear meat already, you ought to. Um, Especially spring. Yeah. Well, and I mean, in the fall, they're great too. You just, there's a lot more work getting all the fat off of them. <laughs> I'll take a post huckleberry bear any day. Um, so when you're setting up baits, Leon, like, and I'm going to get into where to shoot a bear with a bow because like that gets debated a lot. And I really want to hear from the guy who's had countless hunters succeed. Probably some fail. We can talk about the failure, but you know, for me, as I work through places to bait, here's what I eventually did. Feel free to comment if I'm doing it wrong or not. Like I said, I haven't baited in a few years. Uh, we're thinking about doing a bait this year, but mainly just because I got some new new friends that are in, getting into bow hunting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the best controlled environments to make sure they don't shoot a sow with cubs and that they can make a pretty good controlled shot. You know, spotting and stalking a bear, bears just don't ever stop moving. So when you're on the ground with a bow, I've shot many spot and stalk, man, it is, it's just nerve wracking. Cause it's like, they are constantly moving. Even when they're just on a road feeding their spazzes. But at the end of the day, what I finally found that worked for me is you got to know the rules. You can't have your bait X amount of distance from running water, a national forest road, but it doesn't mean you want to go 10 miles in the back country. Cause you got to, like you said, keep that thing fed. Right. So finding good topography, saddles, ridge lines, things like that, where water's not too far away. Cause they do need a lot of water where they can bed and where you can play the thermals and get in and get out to your set. But I, I think I told Molly at the beginning, when you guys got here before we recorded, it was like, I can't even tell you how many big bears I didn't get that knew when I was in the stand and when I wasn't. To the point where we finally, I won't say I invented this phrase, but I pretty much coined the phrase ground and pound is what my dad and I started calling it. And we did it in like probably 13 or 14. We would find an old skid road that dead ended next into timber. And we would hike in a, bar a barrel and a bait and we'd get it loaded up and then we'd block it and we wouldn't put a tree stand up we stopped putting tree stands up but what we could do is we could slip around in the evenings once the sun set or the thermals are behaving properly and we could peek around the corner with binoculars and we could see if a bear was on the bait or not with about 30 minutes of daylight left and then we could cover that 400 yards and we'd take rakes i'm not kidding and we'd rake out the trail or the old cat road so that it was quiet 
We killed several bears on the ground. It was still over bait. Sure. But it was ground and pound. And what it did is it showed me like when I had that tree stand, no matter which way I thought the wind was going to be or do, no matter what, the bear would circle, the big bears would circle, get my wind and not come in those bastards. So we started doing oh, yeah. ground and pound and that really, and it was more exciting to be honest with you to shoot them on the ground. Sure. But that's what we started doing. And then since then, I, I really have been terrible at baiting just because with little kids and stuff, I don't have the time to go up three right. times a week. Right. Yeah. Cause, and you, you got to be that committed to it or it's basically a more or less a waste of time, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. And you know, it's, it's funny because like, I know I had one particular bait just comes to mind. I'd been baiting it for quite a while, had several bears on it, this, that, and the other thing. Um, and had a guide go in and set up a tree stand and, um, he didn't, you know, um, he didn't understand where I wanted him to put it. Um, but I thought, well, you know, I mean, these bears, they smell us at these baits all the time anyways, even if he, has an inkling that we might be around somewhere this that or the other thing it should be all right i started putting hunters in that stand nobody was seeing nothing nothing and i mean you know i got multiple bears coming to this bait anytime when there wasn't a hunter in the stand man i'd put a hunter in the stand nothing and so finally we moved the tree stand and put it more you know where i what i had where i thought it would help and immediately we started hunters started seeing bears and taking bears out of that stand and so something as subtle as moving your stand from you know uh you know say when you walk into this bait where the where the original stand was was at about three o'clock to the bait well i put the I, instead of putting it there i put it over here at 10 o'clock and the difference between that was the whole difference in and nobody seeing anything and guys seeing multiple bears in one night from the same stand. Um, so there's a lot of little things about it. One thing about bears is they're all individuals and um, some of them, and this is the same bear that's going to climb right up on your porch at, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon because you're barbecuing and knock your barbecue over and whatever. And um, I mean, some bears aren't scared of anything, including you. And so he doesn't care if you're sitting there in that tree stand or not. But other bears, um, if they have any inclination that you're around in any way, shape, or form, you're never going to see that bear. And there's ever there's all different variations in between. Um, I think that uh, I learned that a lot running dogs, how individual bears are. Mm. I mean, one bear, and and, it, and it's not all tied to size even one just average bear will stay on the ground and and hold his ground against however many dogs you want to put on him he's not going to climb a tree no matter what i mean no matter what them dogs do um he's not climbing and then you'll get another bear a big bear that's more than more than capable of defending himself he'll climb to the top of top of the tallest tree he can find and hide his head and it's all it's all up to the bear. I mean, any bear is capable of getting away from dogs. Um, it's just a matter of personality to a great degree, and mm -hmm. um, and this is, they're the same way. At a, they act the same way at a bait. You know, some of them will walk right in with full full no, full well knowing that there's somebody around, and others, if you don't play every card perfect, they'll you will never see that bear. We got a bear right now that he's been hitting a couple of our baits for probably the last five years and we're pretty sure one of the guides heard him kill a cub right up on the hill right above the oh yeah or up, well a client well i don't know if the guide heard it or not um but either way um we're pretty sure he was up on the hill going back and forth waiting for the hunter to leave one day and killed a cub or got a hold of it and mauled it anyway or whatever because somebody heard a cub up there just bawling like crazy and we were trying to hunt this big chocolate boar that's been on this bait for years but um I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever get that bear. Cause yep. There, I got quite a few. I think uh, it was 20 or 21. We thought I had this spot where it was like there was always bears eating no matter what time of day. And then every time I sat in my ground blind, which I've already learned the hard way ground blinds aren't great ideas when you're out of bait because usually the bears will sniff it and destroy it. 
but we risked it for the biscuit. We really blocked this ground blind in. It was a cool setup, Leon. I mean, it was like 30 yards from the barrel and I only got in it once there was a, like the sun would kind of set and I had about 45 minutes and it was pretty healthy hike. So I'd have to hike up, change clothes. And then I wait. I mean, I was patient and I'd slip in and I sat this blind, I don't know, five or six sets. And I was pulling my hair out because every time I checked the trail camera, it was like a bear party at this bait. Food's getting crushed. They could smell us. So we literally kept the ground blind there, but just put a tree stand 25 feet above the ground blind. And I killed a bear the very next sit. It was just that little nuance, which is so interesting to me. But speaking of killing bears, where do you tell your clients to aim specifically archers? We could talk about rifle guys as well on a bear well you know i my my feelings about it and from what i've seen over the years is they are not that much different than a deer or an elk i'm going to shoot them basically in the same spot i would shoot a deer or an elk i'm going to shoot them right in that crease i'm not going to be that worried about even if i'm shooting a bow i'm not going to be that worried about clipping the back of the shoulder you know, because the way that the way that those, of course, we're built different than a bear, but still yet, you know, in the middle of the shoulder, if you're not low and you're not high, even if you're into the shoulder meat, you're not going to hit, you're not going to hit a bone. You know, that scapula is clear up here, you know, and it runs forward to the point of the shoulder and the point of the shoulder where that socket is, it's, it's right here. You know, if you shoot him here, you're not going to hit it. Um, and, you know, I mean, yeah, a liver hit will kill, but it's, you know, usually, especially when you're shooting a bow, you, you have to have a good enough blood trail to find that animal. And, you know, so, um, I would rather shoot a little bit, maybe in front of the lungs even, or, or, or not hit the lungs as well. And the reason why I say that is because all of the plumbing that feeds the heart, the brains, all the big arteries and everything that 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 you know keep the the carries blood is going forward. I mean, there are a couple. I'm I'm not sure exactly how. I mean, it goes forward up, and then you know you've got those. We got, you got the 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 aorta or whatever that runs down or no, whatever whatever the huge veins are that come right underneath the spine that go down into the the uh, the back legs. But most all of that plumbing goes forward. And I've seen more bears lost or very difficult to recover because of being shot too far back than anything. I, you are saying what I thought you wouldn't say, to be honest with you. I'm surprised, but I also believe you. You've just been there, done that. Bears have thin skin. Can yeah, we agree not, with that? Like maybe some of the thinnest. I mean, they're well, it's thinner than an elk. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's thinner than an elk. It, it's probably possibly a little slightly thicker than a deer but i mean they're a they're a thin-skinned animal yeah and then their hair is like a sponge yeah and all it does is absorb blood that you would mm -hmm. hope to be on the ground that you're not gonna find a lot of instances because mm -hmm. it's soaked up into the sponge like material called hair bear hair uh so i do agree with you as far as like man a pass through would be really important on a bear to get two holes versus one just because of the sponge like behavior of the hair shooting them in the middle or kind of like off the middle a little bit towards the shoulder is still where I aim to be honest with you. But I have only lost maybe, yeah, I've lost one bear for sure. And I have the video footage where I shot him at an elevated angle behind the shoulder tight. Now, because of the angle, it's tough to like figure out what happened. And angles, angles are probably the most important part of, of that shot placement. You know, I mean, when you start talking about picking a spot, that spot only applies if that bear is at the exact angle that you're envisioning, you know, I mean, so if it's exactly 90 degrees to you and you shoot it, you know, six inches behind the shoulder, yeah, that's going to be a good shot. But if that bear's actually quartering towards you a little bit, well, now all of a sudden you've clipped one lung and hit the liver a little bit. Yeah. You know, so I tend to err towards, I would rather hold tighter to that front shoulder. I'm not that worried about hitting that shoulder blade 
or or that or the you know any part of the shoulder bone um because there's a good amount of meat there in the if you, if your elevation's correct there's a good amount of meat there before you're going to get to any any type of bone that's going to stop an arrow and you know the first bear i ever shot with a bow it was very close i was elk hunting and i was cow calling and this bear come wandering into the setup and i was just like what the heck i've never shot a bear with my with a bow in my life i'm gonna do this and um you know i held that right up tight in the crease of the shoulder the bear was perfectly broadside to me at about 10 yards or less and um that bear took off and it hit the ground once and then it went to try to jump over a log that was about that high off of the ground and it slammed into the log and it fell over on its back and went bah. yeah and that was it I mean, huh. that bear was stone cold dead in two seconds. What do you it think was, about this, man? Because you're the outfitter. You got people, they're your clients, your customers. Like you said, pick a spot. And I kind of laughed because picking a spot on a bear who's on a cat road at four o'clock in the afternoon, man, that's easy. I can see where I'm hitting. Pick a spot at 7.30 p.m. when you have 30 minutes absolutely. of daylight left and it, the shadows and to, to identify a spot on a bear is like next it's just impossible and the last thing is like especially you know when a bear comes in and and they sit down <laughs> and whatever and it's just this big black glob is all it is you know i mean you can't identify where the back of the shoulder is and yeah. the, the front of the leg or anything Do you tell your clients that kind of give them a heads up well yeah you know and i mean we try to set our baits up you know where where the guys are going to be close enough um well so i don't use barrels on okay. my baits yep um i mean for one thing you know packing all those barrels in and out of the woods twice a year well you know in for spring season out and then back in for fall season back out that would be you know that's a tremendous amount of work on its own um so what i tend to do is i i try to place the bait in a in a in an area where, you know, the bears are going to find the most comfortable spot to come in there and sit down and eat. And so I try to get it to where that bear is going to position itself at a slightly quartering away angle to the hunter in the stand as he's settling in to eat. So I tell my hunters, you know, as long as the bear is acting relaxed and everything's fine, then just let him come in and get settled down. And he's going to work his way around into more than likely a good shooting angle for you. Yeah. Um, Cause I feel like, you know, a slight quartering away is, you know, um, home run. It's a home run. It should be. Yeah. We started um, doing these interesting setups where we didn't use barrels, but we'd use, you know, like a log pile or whatever. And you know, you do try to figure out where the bear's going to position himself to get into the food and sit uh, but what we, this is crazy. We, we would want to like do skyscraper tree stand setups like we do for deer, like 25, 35 feet up in the air. But what we discovered was the margin for air on a bear, in my opinion, is just a little less. The, the vitals are definitely just a little bit different and coming down with arrow trajectory. So we started trying to find places where maybe we put a tree stand instead of a 20 yard chip shot, we'd like push it back to that 30, 35, 40, but we'd bring the tree stand down to only 10 feet off the ground to try to mitigate mm. a, any weird angle, like the trajectory was a little more flat so that we could get better shots, ideally quartering away. Do you guys do that with your stands? Well, we don't, we don't make them particularly high. Um, almost all of our stands are ladder stands. Mm. Um, and they're, you know, generally like a standard 12, 14 foot ladder stand, something like that, maybe 16. Um, and, you know, a lot of it, is all it's all dependent on um wind direction really more than anything you know where's your prevailing winds and, and where are your thermals going to be in the evening um you know if you've got those two things working for you which come sometimes it's hard to get them both working for you <laughs> at the same know when you get that one figured out yeah right right but uh, you know um you got to think about what's the wind going to be doing that time of the day so thermals is as much of anything and and one of the biggest things is you know where is that bear most likely to come from mm. you know um so there's a lot to think about when you're trying to pick a really good setup mm -hmm. you know um 
you ever backtrack a bait like after it's been established for 30 days and you got lots of bears and you ever just start backtracking your bait to see the kind of bear trails they build up in 30 days? Uh, Well, you know, I mean, I, or when you're recovering a bear, a lot of times you'll, a lot of times you'll end up going down that same trail, but yeah, yeah, you have, or I mean, I have, and, um, yeah, I mean, they, they will typically beat in a couple of paths. You know, it's going to be like either he's either going to come down this trail or he's going to come down that trail. Either way, he's going to be coming from the north or northwest. Yeah. You know, well, you got, you know, we got a wind coming out of the southwest. So how do you, you know, how do you set that up so that you're going to get, um, you know, that bear's going to come all the way in without ever smelling. And one thing that I do is... I never have a hunter go all the way to the bait with me when I put him on the stand. He always goes directly to his stand. The guide goes to the bait station, baits the station, and leaves. And, you know, those bears are used to somebody coming into the bait, putting bait there, and leaving. Yes. And so a lot of times if if it's not a real educated bear then once that's all done and he hears the truck fire up and drive off or whatever, he's sitting up there on the hill. He hears all this going on or he's sitting down there in the Canyon. He hears all that go on. He's like, Oh, dinner is served. Mm -hmm. Here I come. Do you think dominant bears take dookies right next to the bait? Or is that just in my imagination? You know, (laughs) well, they're all different. Yeah, they are. You start dealing with a, with a, with an educated bear and he's probably not going to do that. But if he's really a dominant bear, um, he's going to show up right after dark. And if there is another bear there, if another bear has beat him there or whatever, um, he's going to push him off of it immediately. And he's going to take all he wants and then leave the leftovers for whoever. And then, you know, like, like I said, it all depends on how educated the bear it, bear is, and then it, it also depends on how scared of humans that bear is. Mm. You know, because like I said, they're not all. You know, I I don't believe. You know, some of them aren't scared of humans or dogs or anything else. I bet I had like that dude was a cub killer. He killed the little teddy bear sized cubs, the kind that you want to pick up and cuddle. He killed. There was two. He killed one of them. And then a day went by and the mom and the little one were still coming into this bait. This was many years ago. Mm -hmm. And we picked up on trail camera and kind of put two and two together. And when I, I started hunting right away as soon as he showed up and uh, the little guy came into the bait that night and started looking for food and he got one bite out, one little donut. And then he looked around, dropped the donut and took off running up the hill. um, Opposite direction. He came in and I knew, I knew that, he was common. And, um, last, I think it was two years ago. I found another cub. This was a little bit bigger one dead on the side of a logging road. Um, fantaside. I'm assuming it's just, I don't think people understand how ruthless boars are to get sows. Have you guys run across any of that? I mean, you know, you mentioned that one story. Oh, you know, I've seen a lot of evidence of it, you know, um, like I remember going to a bait one time and there was a small tree right next to the bait and you could see where, all the way up to where it, it was too small to support a, a an adult bear. That tree was just ripped up one side and down the other. And I'm just looking at the whole scene. Yeah. What it what it appeared to me was that there was a there was a cub that had climbed all the way up in the very very top yep. of that tree to try to get away from a boar. And whether it was the boar or the boar and the sow. Because I have seen situations where a guy had a got ahead of a really neat video one time of um, a sow, a sow put her put her cub up this tree and um, and then uh, I can't remember if I think she got up in the tree as well and then this boar come up the tree after him and she ended up knocking him out of the tree you know whatever but. You know, it looked like something along those lines had, had gone on there. You know, I mean, the the tree was just demolished, you know, and you could see there was a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of activity in that tree. I would suspect that was something was something along those lines. So but, do you think bears um, 
and I know you're not a biologist, but if I can be frank, I feel like you have so much time in the field. It's just, I want to hear your observations, call it a theory or, or whatever, but just, do you think a lot of bears will end up denning in the same general drainages? Like they have like a, this is a great place to den up because it will be remote. It'll be South facing. It'll get melted first. It'll be good. Like, or do you feel like a bear just dens wherever is convenient? Any observations on there or theories? I think that, I think that in general, yeah, they will. A lot of them will den in a similar area. And from, from what I've seen, actually, I think a lot of times it's on more of a North or East face um, because they don't want the ground to be getting saturated every time that the sun comes out all winter, you know, yep. or whatever. Um, they don't want to get flooded out every time we get a Chinook and yep. the snow starts melting, so on and so forth. Um, I think in general on really good berry years, when we have a lot of huckleberries, more of the bears will down up high. But I also think that bears have a each bear within his territory, there's a good chance he's going to find a particular place to go back to. Maybe not the same exact hole, right? But a canyon or a, or a, a an exposure in a, in a in a certain canyon that he's going to go back to. And years ago, um, up by Bonner's Ferry, for multiple years in a row, I would find. Um, about the first, you know, the end of October, first week of November, we start getting them first snows up in the mountains. There was a really, really big black bear. I mean, the only, I mean, I only assume it was the same bear because this bear was, you just don't see a whole lot of six inch wide front pads walking around in North Idaho, you know? Yeah. And for like three years in a row, after the snow would fly, this bear would walk up this one drainage and actually where he was headed, he was headed up towards like Romano's lakes. Okay. And every year for like three years in a row, after we got the first good snow, I would find where that bear would come out of like the Highland flats area down on the bottom. And, and I would keep cutting him crossing roads. And he, and in the last I knew, and I, I believe he was headed up near Romano's or up into the head into pack river to go Dan. I guarantee it. Yeah. That's so cool. And, um, so I think they have a, uh, you know, they have a place that they go back to. And, and once again, I mean, every bear is different. Yeah. Um, you know, a friend of mine who <clears throat> he guided for Cody Carr quite a bit. Um, Adam Johnson's his name. And, um, oh yeah, I think I ran into him at yeah. some point. Yeah. Adam, Adam, well, Adam actually has, a, uh, he does some bear hunts at, in the St. Joe. Mm, okay. And, um, but like I said, he guided for Cody for years. Well, he was guiding a hunt for Cody over there out of Thompson Falls. Okay. And, um, they shot this bear that had a, had a GPS collar on. And eventually he was able to get the GPS data from that bear. And it had been collared the spring before in the same little area where they killed it. And this would be like just east of Thompson Falls up in, on a, on a big south facing slope. Um, where the bear was grassing up well the following year they they collared it right in that same drainage and after it got done grassing up or whatever when it left out of there it went down and it crossed the Clark Fork River and it went over towards Murray it went through all that up over the top down into Mur by Murray Idaho and then it worked its way south in along all that area between there and I-90 eventually it crossed I-90 went on to the south side, then it went up over the St. Joe Divide, and then it spent huckleberry season up just on the St. Joe side of the divide, up in like the head into Slate Creek and that in there. And um, then it turned around, and when the huckleberry started fading out, it walked all the way up by Red Ives, went over the top, dropped down in towards Superior, and then made a big loop out through and went and and denned right back in that same drainage where they had collared it back in April or May, just east of Thompson Falls, just northeast of Thompson Falls. It's a hell of a circle. I mean, that is a... Right. Wow. Right. Damn so, in the Mallard Larkins. I mean, if it... 
Yeah, I don't know if he ever got on the. I don't know if he ever got on the south side of the Dang St. Joe no. River, but he. Yeah, I mean, he. That's cool information, though. Yeah, it was definitely an interesting data to look at. You know. Yeah, they have um, like their own built-in GPS. Really, they know. Yeah. Now, that being said, though, we also had a big bear that was big enough we could kind of identify him, and he was a unique color. He had a big scar on his side so on and so forth that lived right in the drainage right across the road from my house. Okay. And that bear was there all the time. <laughs> He's just residential. He was just resident. I mean, he yeah. lived, he lived right there in that, you know, couple drains. Now I don't know, maybe in the fall of the year, he might've went somewhere else, but he was always in there in the spring. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, for years. And uh, of course one of them big old smart bears, nobody, we, Somebody should have got that bear, but it just never quite happened. Gotcha. I gotcha. Well, I know, I know you drove all the way from Clark Fork. I don't want to take all your time, but I do want to touch on mountain lion hunting mm -hmm. because I think it's, um, the perception of mountain lion hunting in my mind, I thought it was pretty black and white, but, uh, in the social media era, people will send me messages quite often. I'm pretty good at getting back to people, although I haven't in the last few days, so I'm going to be buried in messages. But I got uh, so many messages from the showing us processing the meat. And like Jeff and I were just, we just, we knew that we were eating mountain lion. And I had so many people go, I had no idea that people eat mountain lion. And I just took that for granted. I just thought it was common knowledge that, yeah, it's kind of like a pork type vibe. Uh, it's the other white meat, ha ha, joking, yeah, but yeah. like, um, yeah, you can eat mountain lions, guys. Like it's, it's a pretty good protein source. You know, I wouldn't rank it as good as bear meat per se, um, because it just doesn't have the fat content, but it's still a damn good lean protein source. It doesn't. Yeah. In, in, in my mind, it doesn't have the flavor that bear meat has, you know, I mean, I have a, you know, bear and elk, I guess are probably my two favorites. Okay. And I, I just like that flavor. And I mean, I, I like deer too. Mountain lion to me is I won't, I won't call it bland, but it's not as flavorful as a beef steak or a, yeah. an elk steak or, or, you I know, back that up a thousand percent, you know, um, yeah. one of my favorite things is bear stew. I just, I mean, um, and the more bear meat you put in it, the better. You know? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So. I think that's great. Now, I guess the other thing is, uh, I, so I have my phone right here. Mm -hmm. Let me read you some. So you saw the film that Jeff edited. Yeah. That was great. And we did drop a podcast today about the hunt and I just, man, I'm a pretty transparent guy. I've always learned that being transparent, I don't have to like remember what I said. I probably said what I was thinking and, um, the truth is always enough, but like, sure. I let people know, Hey, I basically, I am, I didn't budget to go on a seven to $10,000 mountain lion hunt. And I understand the going rate. I understand your expenses. I mean, hell you had two guides yourself, X amount of dogs, three trucks, gas bill for all of them, everyone's time. I mean, that was just a one day hunt, right? Right. And so people could try to do what I did, but you'd have to live so close and you'd have to be very convincing, which I think I was on this instance, but it doesn't always work out that way. Um, and I, it's just, it is what it is. Like you're not making, you're not getting rich hunting mountain lions, bro. I think you just absolutely love your dogs. It's pretty apparent. And shout out to Jeff. Like, opening scene of that film you see leon giving his dog a hug and it's like for me that film's about the dogs and the fact that we were able to capture them doing what they do like right. that was the point i didn't want to just be like there's dan he gets out of the truck walks up to the tree shoots the cat picks it up and holds it takes a photo he's a hero like no that's not the story the story is i don't know where the hell these dogs are going to end up we don't know where we're going to be today and this is going to be exciting. And at the end of the day, dude, I do want to kill a mountain lion. I want one less mountain lion on the landscape. There's plenty of them. So can you kind of help explain maybe why you think mountain lion hunting is legit with hounds? Well, I mean, hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like in a situation like that, um, you know, there's a lot that there's a lot that has to come together for you, even though, you know, I mean, it is true that if you've got if you've got a dog that's been hunted quite a bit and whatever, and you happen to come along and there's a 10 minute old mountain lion track and whatever, it can look pretty darn easy. Sometimes it's like, hey, you turn the dog out. He, he trails the thing up there. 
the cat's right there. He jumps it. Cat runs down the hill and boom, it's treed. Now, with that being said, that track where we turned on it up there, and I never did give you that footage. I was going to. No worries. But um, where we turned on it up there, you couldn't even see the track anymore. I mean, we'd seen the track that morning, but we wanted to make sure that cat was still around there, hadn't gone out the bottom and whatever. And we also wanted to look as well as we could to try to make sure there weren't any wolves in the area because Chris, one of the guys that was there with me um, that day, he actually had two of his dogs killed by wolves back in June. Just, right, a couple drainages. Well, I mean, yeah, not far from where we originally turned the dogs loose. So we did some homework to make sure the wolves weren't in there. But long story short is, and we were waiting for you guys, you guys to get up there anyway. Long story short is, by the time we turned those dogs loose, you could not even see that track anymore. The wind had, it was up on a windblown hillside and the track was gone. Now we stuck the dog's nose in the, in the snow right there and whatever, and they picked up the scent and were able to go with it. Um, but in the meantime, I mean, we're talking hours and hours, and that cat had been walking the whole time, obviously, because he went, he went two drainages, you know, well, he was in the third major drainage before the dogs finally jumped him. And then that, that was that, you know, then he ended up all the way down in the bottom of that, all the way down at the creek, you know, after coming up and crossing the road and this and that and the other thing. And, and, you know, one, one thing I will say about mountain lions in general is that, um, and mountain lion hunting is that, um, these cats are getting, they're getting more difficult to, to, uh, to get caught. And I attribute a lot of it to the wolves, you know, and I guess a good example of it is how that cat, you know, I think the dogs had him treed, um, after he crossed the road down there in the bottom the first time, because in total, he actually crossed the road down there in the bottom three times, but I think they had him treed up there. And then apparently he had jumped out, which isn't all that unusual. Lions have always done that. You know, they'll get, they'll, they'll tree once, get nervous. A lot of times when some, when a person gets there, jump out, run a little ways, but he didn't just run a little ways and tree. He went down there. Then he came up, hit the road, ran down the road, went up the hill, used the terrain to his advantage, you know, whatever, then come back down off of the hill, hit the tracks again, ran back down the truck tracks, and then over the bank. And, um, you know, years ago, mountain lions, I mean, they, they weren't, we didn't see that kind of stuff as much. And we had a, we had a Tom in that same area last year that multiple times we would get him treed we would walk in as soon as the first person got there he would bail out of the tree and immediately work his way into the cliffiest rockiest and there's some really cliffy rocky terrain over there and at one point we had one dog we on one of the hunts for that cat we had one dog that had ended up cartwheeling down bad enough that it needed like stitches medical attention we had two more dogs that were stuck on ledges down in a chute and um the cat got out of there and then went and treed on the top of another cliff in about the worst spot it possibly could and um eventually got away in the rocks and cliffs we could have shot the cat but we were, there would have been no way of recovering it it was a sheer drop off to lake ponder a um and long story short i mean we ended up having to lower my son down on ropes to get the two dogs out of the out of the you're kidding out of, no the next day well we we went up that night and we lowered him over the edge about 150 feet to get the first dog and then went back the next day and had to lower him down about 250 feet to the next ledge down from there to get that dog. And uh, we had to get a boat to get the dog that had tumbled all the way to the lake, the one we ended up having to take to the vet. Mm. Um, so the, dog, the cats have definitely learned to use the terrain more, um, this and that and the other thing. Um, and I see them changing 
over time and I believe the wolves are a big part of that. I think they have had they've had to figure out ways to get the wolves off of their tail because if they can't get if they can't shake those wolves it doesn't matter how many kills they make they're never going to get they're never going to be able to 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 uh eat a deer before the wolves just come and take it from them so they got to figure out some way to get those wolves off their case and uh yeah i mean years years and years ago i ran into an outfitter um who told me about a working on a lion study and they had a cat who had her they they had a collar on her and they were watching her and she made kills several nights in a row she killed deer and every night the wolves would steal her deer kill and finally she went up into some big rocks and cliffs and whatever and she stayed up there for several weeks until the wolves had been gone for a long time before she came back out of there um so i've known for a long time that you know the wolves will harass the lions and 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 i believe the lions if they have a pack of wolves hounding them like that they'll end up killing a lot more than a, i mean normally a lion would kill a deer and be there for a week eating the deer it's not going to go out and kill another one tomorrow night unless the wolves take that one that makes sense yeah so i think i think you know um you know the 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 presence of wolves has definitely changed lion behavior a lot. And, you know, just going out and catching a lion on a fresh track here and there, it can look easy. But, you know, when you start looking to focus on, you know, mature cats and this and that and the other thing, and a lot of times conditions is what makes it so difficult. You know, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll have you know you'll get on a cat in the morning and everything's going pretty good the dogs are running it pretty good but you're way behind this cat this, this track's probably 12 hours old or this or that or the other thing and then about nine or ten o'clock in the morning it gets above freezing and pretty soon the snow starts dripping out of the trees and it's amazing how the, all that snow in that thick timber com country that we have up here in north idaho all that snow falling out of the trees, you know, if you've got six inches of snow in those tree branches and it all starts dumping out of there, it, it can just, it can completely wipe a track out to where dogs can't even run it. And it can definitely make it extremely difficult for the dogs. Um, and then, like I say, the terrain. Um, <laughs> it's, cats always take you into the rocks. Just like where you killed that lion the other yep. day. You know, right down in the, crag i mean that cat fell off the it you know i mean it was literally a cliff on both sides of the creek right there yep. where that cat ended up so um you know i wouldn't say I, I think that bears and bobcats are definitely a little more challenging than mountain lions have been traditionally but the but the lions are getting tougher too that's interesting i just uh, i can't say i've ever done the whole hound thing with bears or whatever mm -hmm. i definitely wanted to check a few boxes uh just because i think there's a lot of hunters that could be tempted to d be divided on hound hunting a little and i just wanted to speak to even non-hunters in that when you get an animal up a tree you can identify if oh, it's male or female absolutely that's step one okay yep. we don't want to shoot females we don't want to shoot females, sows or cats. The other thing is maturation. Like, yeah, you can tell by the stride. We're looking for 40 inch stride or plus, but still no guarantee. And you get up there and you see a cat and it's a Tom and he's soaking wet 90 pounds. Maybe we don't want to shoot him, you know, and it is all regulated. You have an allotment. There is a certain amount and um, nothing's guaranteed. This has been a terrible winter for what you do yeah. i mean how many on a normal year how many folks will you take how like mountain lion hunting anywhere from i mean like you know i'd say on average probably about half a dozen a year you know over the years um and they're with you for probably a week yeah five to seven days five to seven days you know um you know, like this year, I think in 
yeah, in total, um, we were only able to hunt with you know, three different guys that were came out for extended stays. But, you know, one of them got three days of hunting in, three or four days of hunting in, I guess. And um, we're finding a few cats, but we – so one of the, you know, one of the things that makes it difficult – um, we finally located, we had found multiple cats. We actually put dogs on a couple of them, um, and terrain got us on, well, one of them, it was terrain. One of them was private property and terrain. Um, we ended up pulling dogs off of the first couple. Um, and then we found a couple more and then we finally found a cat that we we're like, okay, we're going to focus up on this cat. This, this is a cat worth, worth putting our time into trying to find and um we got he went into a big big piece of country and we just were hoping that he would you know make a right hand turn and or or double back you know or make a hard left either way but if he just kept going the direction he was going there's nothing for a long long ways anyway um we went up there we checked everything the first day he apparently and the track when we found it was about 24 hours old and it was late in the day when we found it it was um probably three o'clock in the afternoon this was back in december so you're talking dark at 420 yeah you know so no no chance of turning on a 24 hour old track with only an hour of daylight left so we're just now we're just waiting for this cat to cross again we got one more day of looking for that cat and he did not cross any roads that night or the following day. And then it warmed up to 40 some degrees and it was going to rain a hundred percent chance of rain, half inch of rain the next day. And I mean, unfortunately I told the guy, you know, my client, I told him, you know, let's save your time that you've got left. Go home. You can come back when we're going to actually have snow in decent conditions. Um, so the weather and conditions is is in this area anyway a big challenge to get all those things to you can have you can have great conditions and if the cats won't move or the right cat won't move it doesn't do you any good you can know where a good cat is or you know i mean and and knowing where he is i mean we might be talking about we we know he's in an area that's that's three miles wide and five miles long and built like an egg carton so yeah we know where he is so to speak we don't know what tree he's under we know he's in that piece of ground somewhere um but uh you can know where a cat a good cat is but if you can't get any decent conditions if it warms up to 45 degrees and rains all the snow off and whatever by the time it's been like that for two or three days you don't know if he's in there or not anymore right because he could have come out and walked went into some other piece of ground and you wouldn't know the difference mm. um so there's just there's a lot of different challenges i guess one um, thing that was interesting leon i guess admittedly i didn't fully understand this correct me if i'm wrong but like from the time you let that dog your dogs out till the time they actually probably caught up to that cat we said he went up and over a couple canyons and you said he was hunting I always thought mountain lions were like hunted kind of like we did, like driving in to get to you. We bumped so many white tailed deer on the road and I'd figured, well, this is a high density area. The deer are crossing here. I figure a mountain lion would just hang out ambush. It seems like this cat and maybe all cats do this. I didn't know that, but this cat was literally like searching and stalking. Do they just creep on deer until the time is right? You know, I would say from from what I've seen, when they get in an area where there's a lot of deer and whatnot, they will, I think, lay in ambush a little bit and, and, and you know, kind of work that area, whatever. Um, but to a great degree, when a cat's hunting, he's just walking. Yep. He's just walking, and then when he senses it, when he senses the presence of a of of an animal, all of a sudden he's going to go into into sneak mode. Um, but I guess I would say he hunts more the way I 
always traditionally rifle elk hunted walk until you find the elk not not even really hunting per se 90 percent of the time not in that hunt mode um where you know then all of a sudden you you go from you know once you once you or once that cat knows there's an animal there then he's more like doing what you would do if you're stalking a whitetail in the timber creeping you know so on and so forth but 90 percent of the time they're just covering ground and waiting until they just bump into an animal um and you know chris they have a few more tools to work with at least at least one more tool that's very um effective compared to us in that they they don't have to see it or hear it they can smell it if it's there and i don't know how much they use their nose but you can bet any wild animal if the wind's blowing to them and another animal's over there they're going to know it and they're going to know if it's right there or not so i think whether they see it hear it or smell it um and i've even observed that with lions that i've seen in the woods and i I haven't seen a lot of them that weren't caught with dogs, but I've bumped onto a few lions over the years. And um, I remember about, I don't know, I was within the last 10 years or so, I was walking up into a canyon. I was actually just scouting for elk that day. And I'm just walking up this trail and I look up and I see this mountain lion walking down off of the hill. You know, it's pretty rare instance that you just walk up on a lion you just happenstance both are walking through the same little area um but i saw the cat and about that same time it saw me or it knew something it, it caught movement and all of a sudden that cat was just walking along and all of a sudden that cat just dropped to the ground and you know went into that sneak mode or whatever and i'm standing there just as still as i can be i'm dressed in full camo whether that makes that much of a difference to a mountain lion or not but the cat had not identified me either way and i wasn't moving and it just started creeping down towards me and eventually i ended up because what it amounted to was there was a big blowdown log in front of me and probably only from about my shoulders up is all that cat would have been able to see from his vantage point and eventually, once the cat started sneaking towards me, I decided that I was going to step up onto the log so that it could see me fully and be able to identify me, you know, and then I figured it would probably run off. And if it didn't, then I knew it was, it was actually stalking me, which as soon as I stepped up where the cat could see me well, it turned around and ran off. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, that's a good example of how that cat wasn't really that cat wasn't sneaking through the woods when no, i first saw no. it he's just walking along but the minute he caught the slightest movement out of his eye um he just dropped and you know multiple times i've turned on cats that were on the hunt and i'm you know i think a lot of times when you're hunting them those toms i mean they're hunting breeding aha uh -huh. opportunity just as much as they're hunting yep. food they got a twofold mission they've got a twofold mission yeah. right right um but they i mean they'll cover tremendous amounts of ground and like that cat that track was you know it wasn't brand new but it wasn't it was it was made within the last 24 hours when we turned on it and that cat still went miles and miles yes sir you know um he covered three major drainages, you know, and, um, and that was just in a morning or whatever, you know? Yeah. I um, still, I was t telling everybody here, we took a bathroom break. I was saying, man, when you showed up with that last dog, that was fresh, relatively speaking. And, and I knew we were getting close to the end of the day and I'd already like accepted the facts that, Hey man, we, we might not get a cat today. That's okay. And you let that fresh dog out. It's on film. That thing jumped out of the tailgate and was gone. I, I swear that cat was treed within 15 minutes of that moment. It was insane. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and you know, I mean, it might have it very well may be that that would have that may have been part of the difference. You know, those those dogs that had ran that cat from where we originally turned loose were getting wore out, and that cat was playing games with them. It yeah. didn't want a tree. Yeah. You know, and um, and uh, you know, it could be. It's it's not often that I've seen where a lion actually wears the dogs out to the point um where they just give out that's more of a that's more what bears usually do yeah yep. bears will run and run and run until every dog on the mountains you know just exhausted and then the bear goes about his merry way and the dogs go home and lick their paws yeah. <laughs> um yeah where you know that's traditionally that's never been the way you know mountain lion hunting has gone but it's I've noticed over the years it's becoming more and more common for these cats to to just keep jumping out. And they may not be able to continue running for long periods of time, but as soon as they catch their breath, they can jump out again. Yep. Yeah, no, walking up to cats in the tree is is, is pretty interesting experience. Uh, it's not for everybody, and I totally get that. That's cool, but it is for me. I'm into it, man. I, I love watching your dogs work. I love where we were. It's kind of like home base for me as far as I just feel really good about predator management when you're in your home area, you know, mm -hmm. your core area. You're like, oh, sweet. OK, because I just know what mountain lions do, what they're built for. A couple questions for you. Just rapid fire. Like, do mountain lions ever hunt elevated? Like climb up in a tree? Yes, sir. I can't say that I have ever seen where they necessarily climb up onto a into a tree or something or up onto a ledge to like lay an ambush. Um, but I do remember catching a female lion one time that, uh, it was a big female. It was big enough that I was like, when I found the tracks, I was like, this is either a big female or, or, or a Tom, you know, um, the type of snow it was in, it was really spreading its feet out, you know, but I could tell it was an adult lion. I thought, well, you know, what the heck we'll catch it. I was going up a trail on a snowmobile and I found where this lion had caught this deer right above the trail and, ev and eventually killed it right below the trail. And um, it fed on it and I'm trying to remember if it drug it back up the hill or buried it right there. But either way, I went and got the dogs and I put them on it. And they ran straight up the hill, and it was very, very steep right there. And they just—they only went up there about 150 yards, and caught the cat. And when I got up there, um, I was getting up near the near the dogs. I was about 30 or 40 yards below them, and all of a sudden, I—I I mean, I got to where I could see them, and I could tell that they did not have the cat in a tree. They had the cat in a hole in a cave. Oh, great! Right, and um, all of a sudden this lion comes flying over the top of the dog's heads, lands out in front of me, runs down the hill and goes up in a fir tree right there. Dogs all run down there and start treeing on it. So I get down there and I start looking at the cat and I can tell it's a nursing female. Well, I never went up there and, and looked in the cave to see, I'm sure there were kittens in there. Yes, sir. But the minute I started to walk up that hill, that cat started looking really stressed yeah. And I was just like, okay, I'll just, whatever. Um, that being said, I believe that cat was just laying up there on its, by, by its, its den and looking down off of this. I mean, it was almost virtually vertical and looking down off of it. And an unfortunate deer just happened to be walking by underneath down there. And it just launched itself off of that, off of that ledge and, right. and caught that deer right there and, and of course killed it and whatever. So, um, I mean, they, they use the terrain to their advantage. I don't know if they, I don't know if they necessarily consciously do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I do know, I think we don't think about it that much because with a bow or a gun or anything else, you can shoot any direction you want. Um, but out there, you know, in natural setting per se, um, 
you know, if you get if you get an elk that's standing 50 yards on a steep hill above you, he's a lot more likely to stand there than if he's 50 yards down a steep hill from you. Because he knows, you know, if you're, well, you know, he's used to being hunted by mountain lions, whatever. A mountain lion could cover that 50 yards downhill to an elk in no time at all. It's going to take him a lot longer to run up it. Yep. And, and the cat knows that too. So anytime he can hunt from an elevated position, and I don't think they necessarily use trees so much as, as uh, or whatever, um, but I think that they, they do tend to kind of stay high on a hillside as they're hunting their way across it because they know if they can come in above something, they got a better chance with a downhill run. Yeah. You, know? you can almost measure how much somebody's hunted kind of by how many mountain lions they've seen in the wild a little bit. Uh, I've heard guys talk about that as a measure, as a metric. Uh, Mm -hmm. I haven't done the math, but I've, I've been pretty fortunate to see a lot of mountain lions while hunting. Um, I know in the early days of turkey hunting and right out of high school. So early two thousands, I lived in, you know, about 15, 20 miles North of here. And I would run into cats all the time while turkey hunting, they'd be stalking my decoys, all sorts of, so I got a lot of tally marks for mountain lion sightings while turkey hunting in the spring. Um, and then I was hunting with Kenton, a guy you went to high school with. We were on his deer hunt in Nevada, and I think we had gotten there day before opener, and we split up to just scout for him, try to find him a deer. And I, I picked the shittiest little cliffed out canyon area to go glass from, kind of hiked up there and popped over the top, and there was a big old Tom laying out in the sun. We saw each other about the same time, about 10 yards away. And then since then, I've seen quite a few here and there, but last year, I was in on three cubs and I was again in some rocky outcropping type stuff. And these cubs were playing and they were waiting for mom. I assume she was out hunting. So I guess that's my question for you is one, you kind of hinted to how many you'd seen without dogs. I'd like to hear that. And two, how often do females come into estrus or breeding cycles? You know, um, so I've seen probably, without dogs roughly 15 of them you know single cats i don't think i've ever seen like a family group together it's always been a single cat um you know and and talking about like you say you saw a lot of them back when you started turkey hunting i think i think a lot of that is you know if you if you are uh if you're hunting in Washington right now in this era, post 96 yes. or whatever, there's a lot, you're a lot more likely to see a cat. We have a polo, dude. You know, just because they are, there are so many of them. You see that um, mountain right over here? I'm not going to say its name, but there's the closest one to us. I got truck cameras all over that place for the last 15 years, and I have never seen so many mountain lions on camera than this year. And what's funny is almost every camera is on a hiking trail because the deer use the trails well, and so do the people. If I could show these people what big cat they just walked, just had just walked by before they went, they'd freak out. They'd freak out. Yes, 96, they shut down hounds, right? It was right around that time, 94, 96, somewhere. I don't know. Oregon, Oregon lost it. Like in 94 and Washington lost it in 96 or the other way around. And I here's the remember. newsflash, Leon. You ain't getting it back. So that hunters remember that. Like once you cut something that maybe you're not like, it doesn't affect you or whatever, circle around a couple years later, you will never get things back. Like they don't go, oh, you know, we changed our mind, Leon. You can now use hounds here in Oregon, California, Washington. It ain't happening. No, I mean, it, and if it, if it ever does actually change and we start, you know, we have a reset on any of that type of stuff where we start getting some of that stuff back that we lost, it would, it's not going to be, it's not going to be in this political environment or even with this structure of government that we have now, it would take a, it would take something so much larger than a, than a conservation movement. I mean, sure. even though there are great conservation movements and I try to support as many of them as I can, um, and participate as actively as I can in, you know, in movements and groups and so on and so forth. You're right. I mean, it, in this current system, unless there's a huge shakeup, we're never getting that stuff back. Mm-hmm. So we, we have to, you know, we have to stick together and 
and support each other. And, you know, um, like I said before we started um, here, I, I really liked the, the conversation that you had with Jeff and Josh about, you know, let's find the stuff that that we can, you know, we have in common because we have a lot more in common. And I feel like I have something in common with most guys out there because, you know, I, I, I run dogs. I hunt with a bow. I hunt with a muzzleloader. I try to trap, but I'm not, I'm not good at it. <laughs> I'm the, I'm the world's poorest trapper, but I try. Um, but, but either way, um, even if you're just the guy that all you do is go turkey hunting and whitetail hunting and maybe go fishing once in a while, you still, you still have, I mean, we're still all brothers. We're all still hunters. We're all still, we all still believe. And even if you don't even hunt, even if all you do is want to be able to go down to the Creek and fish, if you, you know, we still all believe in consumptive use of some sort. And we've got a lot more in common than, you know, than we have separate and, or differences, I guess, would be the right way to put it. And, um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's easy to, I think it's easy to say, well, that doesn't matter to me because I'm never, I'm never going to go, I don't, I'm never going to go chase a bear with a hound or, you know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not interested in, in elk hunting anyway or whatever. I mean, that's kind of a poor example, but, um, but once they get done the way, the way the, that this whole thing's, you know, been going for a long time and I'm, I, this is no news flash to most people, but once they get done taken away, you know, well, right now they're after cat hunting in Colorado mm-hmm. you know once they get done with that they're not going to be done they're just going to move on I'm getting warmed up man it's a warm-up they're just going to be moving on to the next thing I so, saw language in Washington's proposal to not have mountain lion or bear hunting at all that oh, yeah. they're they can they don't need to be hunted they can be that's they'll self-manage and then it's just never that consumptive component comes into it so no man I think it, what you're saying is what I'm hearing is we need to be d- less divided Absolutely. in the nuance and kind of more bigger picture. Yes. There's going to be people you don't like. They make you mad. They say dumb things or you just don't agree with the way they go at it. I get that. That's welcome to being a human, but I also can appreciate what you're saying. Where it's like, man, let's cut out all the noise and just distill it down to, you're a hunter. I'm a hunter. I don't necessarily own hounds and love running bears with hounds, but I respect that you do that and you're not signing up for the PETA newsletter and you're not spending your money on anti-hunting movement or propaganda. Okay. Let's where, where's our common ground. Cause there's there, there is there somewhere. So thank you for bringing up that pod. It did. That is probably our most downloaded episode and I can promise you that day that I woke up, I didn't go, oh, I'm going to do a podcast today that's going to piss off a lot of people. I, I <laughs> promise you that wasn't my intent. I was really truthfully being like speaking genuinely from the heart, like right. just kind of a cry, crying out for a, can we be united? Well, and I, I think it, I think it goes even beyond hunters because, you know, like you were saying that you saw a language written in a, a, a Washington proposal to do away with all bear and lion hunting gone well i you know recently and i don't think this i don't think this bill ever got any traction and i sure hope not um but apparently there was a legislator in oregon who had proposed a bill to make harming any animal in any way a felony that includes a beef cow Mm -hmm. that includes anything anything and everything so it would take out, you know, basically even if even if you just want to protect your right to eat meat, we need to stick together. I mean, it's crazy, as crazy as it sounds, there are actually people out there trying to legislate that we can't 
have a cow or a pig or a chicken. Yeah, no, it's um, strange times, right? Yeah, right. So, I mean, once again, though, we need to stick together on, you know, and I think we need to try to bring in people into and, and, and make them realize how important it is that they help us protect hunting because that's the front line. Mm, just yeah. like you know hounds 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 and trap dogs d- dog hunting and trapping has been the front line for a long time once they get through dog hunting and trapping then it's going to be all hunting and then once they get past all hunting it's going to come down to any animal ownership any animal use or you know like i said there was a bill in oregon to make it a felony to harm an animal a living creature mm, yeah it's a slippery slope so can we could we agree on this man? Like we believe protein, perfect protein source, complete protein, not complementary proteins where you combine, but like pure protein, we're meat eaters at the end of the day. Absolutely. And, uh, some people can choose not to be, that's great. But I have a canine right here Mm -hmm. and, uh, Um. I happen to be like a performance strength and conditioning dude. I am out for protein, perfect protein, non-immunized. And which is why when Jeff made that first cut of our film shot last Monday, uh, he didn't have the food part at the end. And you can ask him, he stand in the corner. I was like, I'm not publishing this video until it shows the rest of the story. And Jeff was involved in the rest of the story. He helped me skin it. Uh, Him and his wife took it home. They got all the meat prep they brought over here. We grinded up cougar, mountain lion burger, and we had it for dinner that night. And I wanted that in the film. And you guys that are hunters, listen up. Like, be prepared to do similar things when sharing with the voting community because a lot of things are going to a ballot box now. Show those people, not the anti-hunters, because there's always going to be a percentage of them. But the majority of the voting population is... Uh, they're indifferent, they're not, they're uninitiated, and they need to know that this is us and we are out there for many reasons, but one of the main reasons is to feed our family. And like, I know that gets overlooked, but when I signed up to go mountain lion hunting with you, yes, I wanted to see your dogs work. Yes, I wanted to take a predator out of those particular mountains, but I also wanted mountain lion back on my menu. I've had it on my menu before. I wanted it back in and that was like the, you know what I didn't do with that mountain lion? I did not get it mounted. I did right. not get a full body mount. I didn't do anything. I got the meat off it. That's what I was out to do was sure. to kill that predator and to eat it. Cause I'm a predator. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> not, I guess not necessary to everybody. Well, let's wrap this up. We've been chatting forever. Um, Leon, the, your website's Clark Fork Outfitters, all one word.com. Yeah, www.clarkforkoutfitters.com. What, um, what's the best way to get a hold of you? What if somebody wants to just call you up, bend your ear, and ask you some questions? Maybe you want to get one of your elk tags, or maybe they want to cut their teeth on some North Idaho elk hunting. Is the best way just to reach out, email, call? Well, yeah, email, call. Um, we don't have a lot of social media, and we don't, I mean, we're on Facebook. We are, there's a Facebook page for Clark Fork Outfitters. Um, if you send us a message on that, it might take a little longer for us to see it. We will see it and we will respond eventually. Um, I, one of the reasons I don't have a ton of different social media platforms is because I have a hard enough time just keeping track of, you know, two, two email accounts between my wife and I, two Facebook accounts between mine and my business, um, two cell phones between the two of us and voicemails at the house on the landline. But we have oh, shout out to the landline. <laughs> Give me that. Well, we, I we, miss those days when you had to like call a girl up and her dad answered the phone. Do you remember that? <laughs> Kids don't even know. That's why I tried to, I tried to keep my daughter from getting a cell phone for just as long as I could. She How argued. long did you last? Until she was about 12, I think. Oh. 14. I don't know. Maybe a little older than that. 15. I like that number way better. Was she 15 before she got it? Yeah. And she'd say, well, I got, I got to have a cell phone, dad. And I'd be like, well, for what? And she was like, well, because, you know, because if I'm walking down the street, I need to call you or whatever. I'm like, honey, there's only 500 people in this town. It's not that big. You can just, you know, 
walk back home or send your brother home if you're hurt too hard. Did battling. you ever have a pager? You know, I never or did a have a pager. Oh man, I had a I, beeper at one point. Yeah. Trying no. to find a pay phone. No, but but anyway, no, we have th we have three phone numbers. They're all on our website. Um, our uh, our email address is on there. Um, yeah, we got a, a Facebook page for the business, and then I I also have have one for myself. Um, yeah, and any any way is good. One one thing about it, I don't check my voicemails every single day. I don't check my I don't check my my uh, all my Facebook accounts necessarily every day. You're a good but, texter though. I'll give you credit. Shoot the, one shoot thing, the man a text. The, the one thing I do, yep. If you want to, if you want to get a hold of me right away, send me a text. I I look at my texts regularly. Well, real let, regularly. Let me sell this for you, Leon. Molly, you'll appreciate this. Here's my idea for you guys. So if you if you're unsuccessful at securing a tag because you got states like Colorado where you used to just go buy an over-the-counter tag and they're probably going to go away with OTCs. Wash, uh, Idaho wants to go to a job, all this kind of stuff. If the fall is coming around and you just have deer tags and you don't have an elk tag, maybe hit them up for a fall bear tag, whether it be bait or running hounds. Do a little bit of both, which is cool. That's the cool thing about hunting with you is you could, you could sit a bait at night, but you could go do run the dogs during the day, kind of a combo. Well, yeah, and you know, like we had a we had one guy last fall who he came in. Um, they elk hunted for two or three days, um, and uh, him and Cody got on a good bull on a six by six and got that bull knocked down on the second or third day, and then um, I think it was the fourth day or whatever. Um, he went out and sat on a bear bait and uh, shot a pretty nice chocolate bear on a bait. Yeah. So, um, you know, if it, you know, you got to kind of decide where you want to, where you want to put your time and, and everything, but there's multiple opportunities available um, yeah. to, you know, possibly hunt, hunt multiple species, especially in September. Mm, yeah. So or go do what I did, man. Like get yourself slotted for a mountain lion hunt, do a five or seven day, just reach out. Uh, I'd love to see you get a mountain lion. I'd love to see you try mountain lion. It is good food, and uh, it's a great adventure. Watch the dogs work. But these are some blue-collar people. I mean, the guy's a construction worker, and he comes from a, a long line of hunters, and specifically your dad with the plot hounds. And um, I don't yeah. know. I vouch for these people. I met them. They're awesome. Salt of the earth. So head over to the website if you guys are interested. Hopefully you enjoyed this conversation. Let us know what you thought. And remember, separation is in the preparation. We'll catch you on the next one.